we're doing some paintings, we're having a cool concert, or it needs to be very collective in the holistic approach for community and economic development. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, politicians come and go, and particularly at the local level, and if you live in local rural America, you understand the influence that these local leaders have. And oftentimes, they don't have a paid professional economic developer. You may have one that represents an industrial foundation that incorporates multiple counties. And I can assure you, if they're talking about doing an economic development strategy, or they're going back for some uh, taxes to use for economic development, the likelihood of them thinking about art and culture as a part of that is very slim. And what I'm suggesting to you and challenging you all, and I wish I could multiply you all and take you back to my footprint. We've got some incredible leaders around this place <coughs> in our footprint. But when I was last night at the hotel, I was reading through all the bios. And I'm sorry I won't get to stay for the rest of the day to really meet you, but talking about some impressive people. I mean, I was reading these bios, and I'm like, my gosh, I'd love to come and sit down and pick your brain and have you teach me on how we can do things better, how we can connect with you, how we can leverage our resources, and how can I use these types of positions and agencies to elevate the conversation and engagement with the advocacy to the policymakers at the local level. I can't stress that enough. When you're engaging in these projects, it's not just about the project. It needs to be tied to the business model. Because in a lot of our places, when you sit down to a county supervisor, a county judge, and most of my places are called county judge, or even a mayor, you say, hey, may I want to come talk to you about creative placemaking. <laughs> now, you all are incredibly intellectual, and smart, artistic individuals. When that comes out of my mouth, and I'm talking to a less enlightened local elected official, <laughs> That is not always what we want to, what they want to talk about. Because then I spend the next 45 minutes to an hour trying to connect the dots on what that really means, right? Peel that onion back. What does that mean to the local community, regardless of the size of the rural community? That's critically important because at the end of the day, the results, the vision here, is that you're trying to make your community a more attractive place for investment. And the chairman is right. When we are traveling in, in our two regions and we see the opportunities that are being created for additional investment, business investment, please let me challenge you all when you're having your conversations at the local level on your projects, on creative placemaking, please connect the dots with the business model. So that's the first point. It's got to be a part of the economic and community development strategy. If you hear of a strategy being funded in your community, you need to raise your hand, find some local champions. <coughs> Get with those individual community developers or regional state reps or whatever the elected official that's driving that idea and have a conversation and educate them about what this means and how you need to get plugged into that strategy because you should be included in that strategic planning or research that's being done on how to create jobs. Number two, stronger partnerships and collaborations at the local level. And that's easy to say, but here's what I really mean by that. When these efforts are taking place, like, the, I don't, well, this thing's being live streamed, so let me be mindful of that. Because <laughs> I'm not always the most gracious about being politically correct sometimes. And I do love my job, and I love working for this president. And we're passionate about what we do for a living. But there are communities that are not very good about creating collaborations and partnerships, of, of not being inclusive. And I will bring up a couple of these examples. Even the, one of the super music blues festivals called King Biscuit. Um, some of you may have come to King Biscuit. And bridging the blues trails, about three state efforts uh, to really focus in on some international efforts that we're trying to do. One of the things that was important about that is about actually bringing everybody to the table to have conversations about why that's important to make investments in, not only for the private sector, but the public sector, because the cities and counties were putting money in that, taxpayer dollars into these efforts to help do that. But when, you're, when your neighborhoods are crumbling and you're worried 
worry about your schools that have been taken over by the state. And when you're in my footprint, 70, 71% of the kids need remediation going into uh, college. Uh, you've got to be mindful of that. And the other thing about that is, more directly, is that there are still issues of race in the South. It is real. It happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. I don't want to speak for other places. But as you can see, this election cycle of this country, we have a few issues with that. And we're scared to have that conversation. And we need to have that conversation. And so when I say partnerships and collaborations, we can't be afraid to do that. And we can't be afraid to recognize all of the cultural and arts and place-making opportunities that come, even in communities that sometimes are very scared to have that conversation and engage in the community. That's very important. Partnerships and collaborations. The other part of the collaboration piece, real, real quickly, is the business <coughs> side of that. Right? There is a direct link to the business community. This El Dorado project I was talking to you about, a guy by the name of Madison Murphy. Now, Madison Murphy is from El Dorado in Union County very extremely wealthy individual. Regardless of the project, as John and I was just talking, this was an amazing opportunity to bridge politics, to let arts and culture bridge the division in politics that we have, particularly in rural America. This is an individual you can Google him. He's one of the biggest Republican contributors in the country. He's chairing this effort to make sure that these resources are raised because he sees the long-term potential both for the business side Raising the cultural awareness and engagement and participation is very important. And then third and lastly, uh, the reality is, is that you've got to hold uh, the investors accountable. What I mean by that is that we need more capital investment opportunities in the region to do these types of projects. And they need to be tied holistically. And what I mean by that is that the resources that we're going after, Chuck reminds me of this all the time, but, you know, we are an underserved underserved and under-resourced part of the country. And we need more resources. And, but it needs to be tied to the overall holistic strategy for the community. It's not just about this particular investment opportunity. So, advocacy, education, partnerships, collaboration, and then you, you gotta just be tenacious and bulldoggers on the resources. Respond, or are you ready for your next question? Next question. Next question. All right. So, yes, I'm Sandy Kurt. I'm from Kentucky. Yesterday, you guys heard from another Kentuckian, Joe Berry, about a big announcement of jobs coming to the area directly linked to quality of life, which was directly linked to creative place making, which was directly linked to arts. Uh, in a small breakout session, I had the opportunity to share with everyone another story that was happening in the promise zone in southeastern Kentucky, which was Euro sticks, 90 jobs coming because the operating expenses in three different rural communities were equal in quality of life, which equaled creative placemaking, which equaled arts, is what drove that decision. Now, both of us have got newspaper clippings, we're writing it down, we're sharing the story. But to get those examples, since there's not that good qualitative source to be able to say, economic developers, this equals jobs, okay? How, what is the best way we can get that story, these unique qualitative stories pushed out there and in the hands of people that can utilize them to be able to draw the quantitative analysis? Um, well, I think it's, again, thinking about your networks and thinking about those networks pretty expansively. Um, so somewhere in this room, Jay Dick is hanging out, but I can't see him right off. I know we all know he's here, but if he's not, if he's not here at the moment, he'll be back here in a moment. Uh, the, um, use Americans for the Arts. Uh, they're a great resource. He's in your list of participants. Um, one, it can help give you the larger context of economic, um, the, the economic reality of the arts in your region. And then you have the secondary story. But here for me um, is another piece, and I'd be interested in Jamie and Jason's perspective, mm -hmm. and anyone here. We also have to understand 
the, the newsmakers have changed. So you cannot send off a press release and expect that you will get any kind of coverage, maybe a two-liner, who cares? We did have a conversation that in small town, rural America, those local weekly papers and, and bi-weekly papers are desperate for stories. And their stories will be 15 column inches as opposed to two. So leverage those resources. And in the larger communities, sometimes it actually takes sitting down, calling an editorial board, and bringing in a collaboration of people, not just the arts people, but finding out who is the group. It's what Chris has said. So the economic developer with the arts person, with the policy maker, with the person who actually is likely to get a job or has a job. And you go in and you talk about transformation. You talk about quality of life. Because we've got to frame those kinds of stories because I don't know if anyone's looked at news stamps on newspapers, but they have shrunk. There's like three people working for newspapers anymore. They pick their stuff off, off of news aggregating services. So you have to treat those news people very differently than you did even five years ago. Um, and then look for other venues. So um, my reality now is that I work for the National Association of Counties. Um, I'd suggest you talk to your county leaders. That's a really great story. That's something that county news would talk about, and that goes to 40,000 places around the United States. Because I'm guessing what you're saying is, it's a story for Kentucky, but it's a story for everybody. Because what you want, I think, is the learning that goes on that people are reaching out. So framing it is important. <clears throat> Um, not just in your reality, so for those people who, you know, care about numbers, because I know Chris does, um, on the, on the, but, but we have to think that way, because that's part of how you leverage it. So one of the places that NACO has gone now is with a massive amount of research on finance and on economic reality. There are some very deep realities. Chuck has brought them up. Uh, foundation investment is somewhere around 5% in rural America. So when you're doing good, it is something to make sure Council of Foundations knows. Um, the reality is that in America, about 50% of counties nationwide are still not back to 2008 status. And to frame this even more, there are over 3,000 counties in the United States. Of closing in on 80% of the population lives in about 130 of them. Do the math. There are 2,500 counties across the United States that look like the counties that many of you come from. And what do we know about them? <coughs> Their resources are falling. Two thirds of the counties in this nation are spending significantly more than they were five years ago on public safety, justice, and opioids. And the result that comes from it. You have to frame this in a way that offsets it. We are giving people hope, a job, uh, building more homes, because that is ultimately what's gonna offset some of the problems that we have with drugs. So you have to become a better storyteller. Um, it's a great story, but reframing it and finding the partners that can tell it with you. Uh, I, uh, I'll be very quick because, because really you pretty much hit everything. I just had three things. One was, and, and um, uh, part of it was uh, uh, kind of comes out of a conversation that I got to be part of 
in the last week or so on uh, immigration in rural and how to um, you know how to make rural places more inclusive. And so this is partly these comments are partly in response to Bob's question, partly to your question, Sandy. Um, and I think research is really important, showing what it means, what culture and arts mean to certainly economy jobs. Everybody gets that, and they're always going to want to know that. But what are other indicators that can resonate with the audience? Um, uh, you know, how to measure um, people, young professionals' desire to live in a particular place. There's ways to do that. They, there's best of all this all the time, right? I mean, they measure that stuff. And I think the, and I know some of this is going, but I, it's already happening and, and a lot of the organizations already mentioned, but doubling down on that. I, from, from my experience in the last almost eight years in the administration in a different community economic development um, policy roles, that movement towards data is, I mean, it's a whole other conversation about how I think rural is at a, a disadvantage in that conversation because of scale, all that, and we can maybe want to talk about that a little bit more. But, and I was in denial about the whole thing for a while, sort of personally, I thought, you know what, this whole conversation just doesn't apply to rural. We're just going to have to make it not apply. Now, it's going to apply to rural. What we need to do is figure out how to make sure that the data, the metrics, uh, are informed <coughs> by the rural reality, and that those who make decisions on that data understand, you know, the specific uh, rural reality of less scale, you know, remoteness, etc. So that so research one, um, two is you said this, but finding the right voice in the right channel. Okay, comms one hundred and one here. Um, but here in a lot of places, Chris, you talked about the, the business leader. Uh, a lot of times, the best voice on this is not going to be someone who's in your regular circle. It is not going to be an arts and culture you know, advocate or professional. Just a lot of times to, to really move the ball forward. So that collaboration, et cetera, even more important. The channel, um, and I'll jump right on to what, uh, to what you said, that, um, you know, these were, and you're from all these, you know, lots of you are from rural and you get this, but small newspapers and radio, they eat this stuff up. They've got holes to fill every day. Create content, be very strategic about the content, they will use the content. That's at the local level. Um, you know, and then, and then there's a, another question about millennial stuff that, that I'm not gonna get into. The final thing I'll mention about channels, and this is sort of right on Jason's comments, that in the rural sphere, very specific, but an important one for a lot of resources, as we talked about, there is now a platform for stories like this. There is literally a call every month from the Community Solutions team that there's three or 400 people that have gone through the training that Jason talked about, feds who do work in the field or are at headquarters, and we tell these stories. In fact, we're going to tell some of these stories. The White House Rural Council was on the next call. We're the agenda <laughs> next call. But, but there is a, there's a place in rural. Yes, she was. Yeah, you were, it's that, you know, the core. Oh. Sandy participated in that. No, but now there's a, there, there is that virtual community that have been trained and we continue to, to provide content. So there, that's just a specific channel for the feds. I don't know, did Earl or Jim, anybody? Okay, you had another question back here then? There's one up front too. Yep, I'll pop back here. <coughs>
Well, I'm the exact opposite of business terms. Because in my county, we are, the bullseye is Polk County, where Des Moines is sprawling and has sprawled into every county except mine. But mine has got <coughs> crosshairs on it big time with a data farm moving in and people crowing about tax takes and all the jobs that are going to be created and all the development potential that's possible. The, the paradigm that I want to find a translation for is as I sit in the supervisors' meetings, which I do and have done since March, all they seem to understand is the dollar metric that you cited. I'm concerned about the land and the land resources. We were not glaciated. Therefore, we have many more species, native species, plant, animal, microinvertebrates, fungi, that cannot be found even 30 miles north of us. That metric, that, that measure of rural is not part of the equation. And how can someone who wishes to advocate for that component of what I submit is primal, absolutely essential, fundamental, rural. How can that bridge the gap and be heard? You probably just touched on one of the most important but yet dangerous questions uh, that we are asked as not only policy policymakers and investors <coughs> but economic development in the true real sense of economic development there's about 13 different areas that involve economic development everything from workforce training to site location to infrastructure all these things but what you just hit on uh, is the the real core of what drives your economic development philosophy at the local level. Because you have competing interests. You have the state, you have the governor <coughs> to drive his or her economic development strategy. It's about numbers being held back accountable during the next election cycle. You've got your state agencies that are trying to move the needle on economic development, which always centers around job creation and how many numbers can we communicate to the voters about the jobs we've created. And then third, you've got local interests uh, that are also driving that because they want to be tagged to that. They want to be associated with that kind of uh, job creation and progress piece. So the core for me is philosophically, I would, I would be in the pro growth side with caveats. And what I mean by that is economic development is a good thing, but not at the at the sacrifice of local treasures and assets that make you unique at the local level. And as an economic developer, many of you all, in our world of economic development, there's something called the IADC, right? That's kind of the largest, uh, largest group uh, that represents practicing economic developers. And, and there is a code of ethics for economic developers. And part of that is an environmental piece. Uh, but we all come to it a little bit differently, uh, right? My very nature is that, hey, if we can create jobs, let's create jobs, but not at the sacrifice of the local identity, local treasures, assets, that could be both natural resources, it could be human capital, it could also be as it relates to the assets that you're bringing to the table. But the other thing that I would, I would say back to you real quickly is that I would look for the opportunity to quite frankly turn this back around on them and using what you want to advocate for with culture and arts. Now it sounds like we're really talking about land issues and natural resources on this particular example, but where those issues and the environmental piece will get 
filtered out as the course of this process. And there's nothing that can overcome advocacy and letting your voice be heard, particularly at the local level with your elected officials. And that goes back to the question that I was asked earlier. You have to capitalize on your voice and advocacy and let policymakers, elected policymakers at the local level know there is a cons constituency base that is together, that is, that is connected, that is vocal, and if you don't do that, that project will run right over every day of the week as it relates to creative quality placemaking. Because the reality of it is, is that if that voice is not heard, the desire for job creation will take precedent every time. So as a strategy to push back on that, I would recommend doing one thing. Use this opportunity, this prospect, this growth as a way to leverage your own interest by creating more art and culture related activities. This is where you can really say, look, here's, here is a platform to make this kind of project a focal point for our community. It helps with our local image. It becomes the, the creative place for who people do activities in the, in the local communities. These projects can be tied to that. So I'd actually, not knowing all the details, I try to look at this as a way to take advantage of a potential economic development project and tie what I'm trying to do with the creative placement. Use their own momentum and the attention that they're getting and tie what you're trying to accomplish from the arts and culture side to that effort and use it as a way to demonstrate what you're trying to do by making this a centerpiece for the community. Trying to make sure that this is an opportunity for people to take really a great chance to come together and have a, a dual benefit by taking advantage of a traditional economic development project. I don't know if that helped or not, but. Any other panelists? I, I just say that I think that it's important not to fall into the place of either or. Um, that it is unlikely in the face of what you are doing that you will eliminate the development coming your way but it's how do you segment it? And how do you find those critical natural resources and think about them soon enough that you do get to celebrate them um, and that you get to invest in them. And so as, as Chris noted, and I'll tell you a piece from my reality in, in Lynn County, when I went on the board, there was the potential and long of Highway 100 going to the west. It had been discussed for probably 30 years. Um, and I ran on that as a something, perhaps foolishly, that I thought that I could solve. And once I actually got on the board, I realized it was going to take a whole heck of a lot longer than I thought it would. There were some critical natural resources that were there that did need to be protected, but it didn't have to be at the exclusion of the highway. I was in office for 14 years, and about three years before I ended, all the pieces finally came together for Highway 100. But also as a part of that, the Board of Supervisors bought an extra seven acres when we could from local people and added it to Morgan Creek Park. So we took hits on both sides. People who were incredibly pissed off in the environmental community, and on the other side, developers who were pissed off because we went on that side of town and we said, no, some of this has to be maintained as park. And we spent money to do that. So, Keeping in mind that your local elected officials have to be given the tools and the support to do good things. So help them see the possibility of success. That you're not there to just always say no. No development. This can't ever happen. It shouldn't be like this. I get it. I'm sorry. I was the land of CAFOs, you know, confined animal feeding operations. Um, Anyone who's from Iowa or North Carolina gets that. How do you balance that? That 
that is challenging work, and it is not always the place that artists go, but anyone who is in museum work, I will tell you, asking those big questions is and should be the work of every museum, be it a historical society or organization in your county. Because those are the people that can drive those discussions. It will take more discussions than you think you can live through. Um, and it, I believe it can be both, but it takes a lot of hard work. We can actually get a chance to get something out of this, yeah. particularly if you know what's coming. <laughs>
is specifically on the issue of public safety. Um, at Art Place, we've actually commissioned a field scan and seated a working group that's looking at the intersections of arts and culture with public safety. And we've done that with LISC, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, because they're the national TA provider for the Department of Justice Burn Criminal Justice Innovation Grants. So you can find all that information on our website or email me, jamie at artplaceamerica.org, and I can put you in touch with it. In terms of the larger issue, one of the things that I've found to be um, fascinating in how it's ramped up over the last several years is the number of city governments that are actually putting artists in residence. So city governments who are actually paying artists to be that creative force. And one of the ones that we love talking, a project that I love talking about, is in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, an artist called Amanda Lovely went into residence um, at the Department of Planning. And one of the first things she took a look at was how the Department of Planning does community engagement. Right? And we all know how they do community engagement. They host a meeting at City Hall at 2 o'clock on a Monday. Right? And the person with the pothole and the yappy dog shows up and right, not a lot happens. So what Amanda did was she took a look at the city fleet of vehicles and she said, give me a van. Right? And so she took that van and she retrofitted as a popsicle truck. So now whenever any city agency wants community input, they send the popsicle truck out into the community and if you answer three questions, you get a free popsicle. Now she was paid for that, right? She was actually in, that was a partnership between Public Art St. Paul um, and the city government. Minneapolis is doing a similar thing with Intermedia Arts, where they're working with the mayor's office to put um, artists in residence. Mayor Garcetti in Los Angeles has put in artists in residence, specifically in the Department of Transportation, to take a look at um, issues of pedestrian death, you know, Vision Zero work that LA is doing. Um, where I currently live and work in New York, we have artists in residence in veterans affairs, uh, immigrant affairs, youth and community services, and design and construction. So I think it's happening. I think we absolutely need to value and recognize artists as workers. The fair wage conversations, absolutely living wage conversations, need to attach to our sector. So yes, absolutely, there are examples of it, and I'm happy to connect you with more for, you know, if you want to share that with, with the mayor or with the Department of Cultural Affairs as well. I'll just, yes, <laughs> um, add on to that, that there are efforts to actually clarify what artists should be paid for showing up at public meetings. I actually think you should pay people to come to public meetings, by the way, but that's just a personal belief. Um, uh, you should actually pay the artists to do some of those things. One of my hopes is that Rupri, as they build out their kind of assistance and folks like NACO who are interested in also you know, teaching people about these practices, that one of the things that is included in that is here's what it costs and artists should be paid. And so that is something that um, well, it was, will hopefully happen through all this. I'll just say from the NEA side, you know, we are always looking at exactly what the artists are paid as part of any of our, our town projects and we're not going to fund something that's pay artists enough. So um, that's just a simple way that we operate, and we're hoping that more, as, as people can begin to understand what this work is and treat it seriously, I've been using the term like breaking the fever, that, that, that this is just sort of like this fluffy thing over there that you don't really know how to do, that there are true costs, that there are people that know how to do this, and there are real practices, that that clarification includes what it costs to pay an artist. Hi, I'm Nancy Van Milligan. I'm from the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque in Dubuque, Iowa, and we serve eight more than to you, I've been to Clarksdale and seen the wonderful creative placemaking <clears throat> that you've done there and um, stayed at the Shack Up Inn. So for all of you who are interested, you might want to check it out. Um, my question is, um, you know, Chuck kicked this off and talked about access and equity and you mentioned inclusion, participation, engagement, and I've heard it all the way through. Um, at the Community Foundation, we're, we're trying to do some really deep work around diversity, equity, inclusion, and racial inclusion, and, and immigration, um, and find it to be very hard work, and there are very few models, and the models that we have looked at are typically urban. The, the Twin Cities have done some great work, so we work with GARE, you know, uh, Seattle. Um, in our city, we do um, inclusive debut and have some great things that we'd be happy to share with you. But as we go out into our counties, one thing we use is the Heart and Soul, which some of you may have seen um, Jason's breakout session, and that's really good 
um, at a specific community level, but would really love to um, work with some others or find some resources about how to take the scale at a, you know, a, a larger, like a regional area, or how do you bring people together, engage, get them to participate, and really talk about these tough issues. Um, and so I guess I'm just throwing that out as a comment. I hear a lot about it, and um, it is so hard to do, and it would be great in our smaller communities and smaller towns and regions if we had a way to learn from each other and learn from the place and take this to the next level. Sure. Yeah, I'll just jump in really quick. Um, I'm sure everybody has a lot to say about this topic. Um, I think one way we're viewing that at the endowment is that there's, th this is an issue that goes far beyond what the arts can solve itself. And I think the whole conversation about creative mm -hmm. place making is, how can arts work in service to many of these other issues? And I think that the arts in this particular issue are an amazing way to kind of build social bridging across society. It's a place where we can find common cause and be a play. it creates spaces where we can create understanding amongst ourselves. Um, that sounds fuzzy, but it actually does happen. Um, and so I think, again, that clarification of what are those arts tools, where can an artist be useful in those conversations is something we certainly want to spread around. Um, and be serious about it. I do think that there are a lot of organizations that are, you know, there's lists and lists and lists of organizations that are professional at how to have, create a safe space to have those conversations. There's nothing worse than going into one of those conversations where the crowd is not prepared to have that conversation. I've been in some of those rooms, it's really hard. Um, I also want to add income diversity to the type of diversity you're talking about, especially in rural America. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I happy to share lists of organizations that do that kind of work professionally and also happy to share lists of kinds of artists that have experience in, in being in those spaces and handling them in a professional way. And I, Teresa, tell me if I'm doing this correctly, but let me try and get a commitment thing going. Yeah. Um, I think we still have some colleagues here who are connected with Ely, the Intercultural Leadership Institute, <coughs> which is the work of Alternate Roots, PAI, the First Peoples Fund, and NAWA. And I would love to try and broker a relationship among the Community Foundation community and Ely to see if we can bring some of their national work together with the Community Foundation. So if someone can post it that, uh, <coughs> I'm happy to work with Nancy and make connections with those other folks and see if we can do that as a concrete set. Perfect. You did it just right. <laughs> the, the, only, the only thing I'll flag on that that I mentioned the conversation <coughs> I was part of in the last week or so, and that um, the Aspen Community Solutions Team, so Janet, that group, um, they're kind of hosting a conversation around the support by Annie E. Casey Foundation. Uh, and and I, I, I almost, it, it looked like sort of a scoping. You know, they know it's a really important issue. People are trying to figure it out. I think there's some stuff posted there. So there's already a nascent network kind of on that side, too. So I can, you know those folks. And another, um, Place that because we spent a large preponderance for a time talking <coughs> about art, but we are sitting in the College of Public Health. Um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has done an enormous amount of work in this space. So their uh, culture of health work, I think, um, provides a platform for those kinds of conversations. They look quite directly um, at social equity. Um, the social determinants of health that are very significant and you know if you even in aggregated information if you look at it in the rural area it, there are things that just leap out at you um, so I would look at that and honestly Nancy one thing that I would challenge is that in the river foundations that are looking at um, uh, disaster philanthropy I know that, that, that piece of that question is something that I would challenge philanthropy in general to look at. Because the other piece that comes with disasters that makes them so exponentially worse is the equity problem. When there is a disaster, it by far impacts people of color, people of lower socioeconomic status cannot respond. They do not have the same resources. So when we talk about building resilient, healthy, thriving communities, 
you can't get by without having that social equity question. So some of it is going to some of those other partners and driving the question. I think what we're seeing is this is really about different ways of collaboration and different ways of having conversations. Yeah, we're going to move to Chuck, but I know Chris has to catch up. Well, I plane. said I might take him. And he has to tell his else, driver yeah, that we can he can go, but yeah. I could take him, and then he can stay here for at least another 35, 40 minutes. Because I know we have so many questions, you guys, and I know we have about five people lined up, and so I know if anybody has to catch flights, I'm so sorry. But if we can keep you guys up here a little longer, is that okay? And then we'd like to give you a couple minutes just to sum after that. But Chuck's got a burning question over here. Not, it's not a bull impersonation. It's, I'm going to go quick. <laughs> uh, first things first. Uh, the issue of cash GDP versus long-term wealth in two sectors is critical for rural America. I want to say that we have five or six professors from seven or eight universities that won the Lincoln Award this year from the secretary. We must build empirical metrics that get a hard understanding of the cultural impact to overall wealth. Income is a flow. Wealth is a stock. Cultural wealth is a stock. We're trying to build that. It's called a comprehensive rural wealth framework. Number two, to the issue that was just raised by Jamie, as part of our work with Next Generation, we are creating, uh, immediately after this, a rural intercultural council. I think it's absolutely critical that we do this. I want to ask this question, and I uh, appreciate all the kind conversations about what Group Pre has done. Uh, we do hope we can go deeper on these issues. They take resources. I'm going to be very direct. Can you give us some suggestions as a community for how we build sustaining resources to advance this community interaction. Not project resources, sustaining structural resources for rural community and arts development. Do you have specific thoughts about that? This is the burning issue in this room. Chuck, I'm going to bring up something that I know we've already talked about. Um, I'm sorry that Ryan isn't here. I thought I saw Bill Menner still here. How many people in this, Tony's here, great. Um, how many people here farm or have farm? Okay. The Farm Bureau has to be a part of this conversation. Unless they only want to do the insurance business. And that has become a large part of their business. So if they want to anchor the farming community, and if they want to welcome, as Bill Sack has been an incredible advocate for, getting young farmers back on the land, then artists have to have a conversation with people in the farming community. If we value this way of life, if we think it is important, if we don't want to see corporate farming grow to the point where it, like the world, <coughs> become too big to fail, then we have to have those conversations. Because farmers in this country actually have quite a lot of money. Not all. Small family farmers, not so much. Large corporate farms <coughs> have a lot of money. Income as a percent of assets is the lowest amount that has ever been in history. Yes. I, I get that. But I'm talking about a portion of the farming industry that we don't often talk to and about. All farm prices are lower than they were in the Great Depression right now. I, I, I get Pretty that. Much. But trust me, corporate farmers are still making That's a That's not in space. OK. We can maybe have that discussion later. I still think it's worthwhile, Chuck, to have those conversations because even to what you're bringing up is illuminating that we're not we're not having the appropriate conversations with and about sustainability in our lifestyle. And so some of that has to be with partners. We're not always conversational. I don't know anything about farming. Um, but I do know something about communities. Uh, the challenge I think that, that we all have is in developing, it, it, this is really about develop, developing the capacity of local communities 
and to um, the capacity of local communities to have a sustainable uh, um, participation in the U.S. community as, 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 an, uh, as an asset that helps them grow, helps them attract communities, helps them attract kids, keep their kids, and a part of, really, of, of their local economy. And in that process, in developing that, it really is about engagement. And it's about engaging the community, and really is about developing strategies and plans that you can stick to over a long period of time. And you're not going to hit a home run the first time up. You're not. You're going to fail at times. I think that that you know one of the examples that, that we uh, that I like to look to uh, is Jonesboro, Tennessee, where they started with a um, storytelling festival, and they had somebody with big ideas that they were going to like take over the world. They're going to develop this incredible facility, and they went and they borrowed a lot of money. And this guy, USDA, um, <coughs> and they failed. They went bankrupt. They didn't give up. They went back and they reworked it and they went through bankruptcy and they kept their vision and they kept their partners together and they kept the community together. And that community was committed to this idea of being the storytelling telling center of the world. The International Storytelling Center. And keeping to that commitment and keeping to that community, that they've moved from being bankrupt, they've moved through bankruptcy, they've paid off all their debts. And last weekend, they had 30,000 people <coughs> in Jonesboro, Tennessee, listening to storytellers from all over the world. And that's that's the secret here. It's not us. It isn't the federal government. It is the energy and creativity and the imagination and the, the, the hooks of, of the local community. And it's really our privilege to be able to interact in that and to invest in that. And to make sure and to work to see that we're not investing in projects but we're building capacity, capacity to sustain operations, to sustain visions, so that our communities are rich places. So our responsibility is to be smart and to be demanding and be a pain in the butt. And sometimes they call it being, sometimes they talk about federal mandates. Well, yeah, it is sometimes. Um, but that's, from my point of view, the secret sauce here. It is being able to bring those two pieces of the puzzle together in a way that helps make sure the community is successful and to be able to help encourage and stimulate that. But the real energy here is not us. The real energy here is what you see, what I see, in all the communities throughout Appalachia. Well, I'll, um, I'll be really brief. The, from, so Chuck's question, how do you support this infrastructure in a sustained way? Um, I don't know of sort of the perfect pot of money out there that this fits perfectly for. Um, to Linda's point, there's, you know, there's, there's private sector, there's philanthropic, and then there's public resources. All three of those should be looked at. They all have an interest in this. It meets their different missions. Um, the more that, and this is really to Earl's point, the more that the case is made that this meets a mission, whether it's the public mission, a private, you know, economic growth mission, or a philanthropic mission, you know, the more successful that. Uh, attempts in, in, uh, to, to get the resources to build this. I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I wish I had like, oh, I know where this is, and there's a whole bunch of it, and you just need to ask in the right way. I don't know that there is that right now, um, but, but there definitely are different resources that exist to support a piece of this. So, um, not wholly satisfactory, Chuck.
which is not uncommon in our conversations. <laughs> you know, Chuck, you know, one thing that, that we can think about, and, and we've been thinking about this for a while at DRA, you all have kind of motivated me, even here in my fourth quarter here, to make sure that we do a better job of institutionalizing this. Because I firmly believe, as a practitioner, that the creative place makes it an incredible, powerful, and effective tool for local rural communities to improve their situation. I firmly believe that in my, at my core. And so, so much so, we're going to go back, and, and Justin Birch, who's our senior project manager at DRA, we're going to go back and we're going to see how we can actually dedicate a full-time FTE to this effort inside the agency. <laughs> We're still going to, and we've talked about this in some of our community solutions, uh, trying to institutionalize that uh, as well. But one of the things we're, we're going to continue to do uh, in working with the governors, just like with the ARC, you know, the governors are a big part of our structure, uh, making sure that they understand that we want to continue to make this a priority for our investment. So as projects are being reviewed, it, you know, one of the things I get to do as FCC is set those federal priorities, which is step one. Uh, in getting DRA investment. And this is going to be uh, that we're going to put in ink uh, to make sure that it, may, it, it continues to be a federal priority uh, for DRA. So those are two things that I think I can contribute. <clears throat> sure, I mean, I think from our perspective, well, number one, how rad is that that he wants to hire someone? <laughs> it's like, yes! <laughs> Uh, from my perspective, as community and rural development grew as a field and got more professionalized over the last 50 years, cultural policy was on the side. Um, and that everything we've been doing um, through this effort is to try to bring, have those two worlds aligned. And that is not going to happen overnight. Um, and I think that the resources will start to appear more as the people who fund and understand community development and rural development well understand, again, I'm just going to repeat myself, like, what are the standards of practice? How does this work? And what is its benefit? And the more that that is clear and that people know what that stuff is, the more that like you, you'll be able to easily go to someone and say, this is exactly what this is and how it works. People will be more interested, the, the coalition of people who are actually trying to do community development the right way, <coughs> which is, I don't, I don't have any numbers on that, but it's not everyone in America. <laughs> There's, you know, I've worked in economic development too. I know that just like, like, let's just bring in new business, kind of whale fishing stuff. Um, but the people who are trying to do it the right way, those are the people we're trying to convince that this stuff matters. And the more that they know it matters, the more that the funding they're going to put into it. That's what sustaining looks like at all levels, <coughs> state, local, and the feds. I mean, I think the feds are pretty good to go right now. Um, it's, that's pretty rocking and rolling at the state level. It's, it's, getting, it's getting better and locally. I mean, many places are, do get it. But the more that people on the outside of the arts understand that this stuff is important and how it works, the more they're going to start putting money into it. That's what sustaining looks like to me. So uh, my goal is like 50 years from now, every community development person just knows how to do this stuff, like knows what it means to hire an artist. And it, that's success to me, do you know what I mean? And just the thing I'll add as the philanthropy token on the panel, uh, I'll speak from a fundraising <laughs> point of view, which is I think we need to hold philanthropy accountable for the outcomes it's trying to drive and get them to be tactic agnostic. Right? So if the thing that magically created the 90 jobs was an arts intervention, they shouldn't care that it's an arts intervention. They should care that it created 90 jobs, and we should go after job creation funds. And so I think separating outcomes and tactics is really important in terms of the fundraising, and I'm happy to talk more with anyone about that. I think that exact same thing is true. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, it's true for like economic development offices. I mean, one of my jobs was to work, I was the first ever creative economy person hired into a state economic development office. And it was like, there was a lot of like, what the heck is that stuff? You know, and I was like, well, Massachusetts just passed a billion dollar in life sciences job. There's actually less, less jobs in life sciences than there were in the design field in Massachusetts. And we had no billion dollar fund for, for that, for design jobs. But it took showing that we had the same number of jobs how those companies grow differently from a different kind of company, and creating actual like economic development tools that actually work for our field. And those tools don't exist in a lot of places, right? The tax credits, all the things for economic development that are built are for manufacturing and other fields that we know how to support and have supported for a while. So 
the more we can tell people, hey, this is how my business grows differently. And I know there's this rad woman in, in New Mexico who's trying to support creative businesses. And she says, we keep being so modest. We keep saying, well, maybe my creative business will grow to be 30 people someday. Why can't it be a 3,000 person business someday? And why are we not talking about what it would mean to do that? And so um, we got a lot, of, we got a lot, of, a lot of ways to go, but there's there's some seriousness which we approach all this. Great, and we have two. We're pro Kylie and Amy, and then we're going to need to wrap. And I know that everybody, there's a lot of questions out there, and we'll figure out a forum of how we can get those questions distributed um, so we can get more responses. So Kylie, why don't you go next, and then we'll go to Amy. Thanks, Tracy. Can you guys hear me? Thank you, guys. You've been up there for a long time. <laughs> You're being a resource, yes. Um, so those of you who know me know that I do a lot of research for a living. There is very limited funding available to conduct the kind of research that you're talking about that would actually advance case making, that would advance place-based policy, project efficacy, this kind of experimentation, and even less when it comes to understanding the rural differential when it comes to culture. So again, very specifically, where should we start looking for support to create the kind of evidence that's needed to shift practice? Because there's very little. We have a research fund, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, we did create a research fund a few years ago. I would also say that um, from the evidence-based side, I've been meaning to say this subject for a while, we are doing a project to try to evaluate the 325 of our town grants. And as part of that, we're actually trying to figure out what are the tools, indicators, evaluation systems that people could use on the ground to show proof of success with these kinds of projects? Because we know everybody has trouble with trying to show that. So there are places working on that, Kresge's working on that. There's a journey of kind of many funders looking at, and this isn't, again, not true, not just for the arts, people working on place space, mm -hmm. but how do, and how does any place-based investment truly show that it's achieving some kind of outcome that someone could care about? Um, that's a, that's a difficult thing, because like, how does a $50,000 arts investment, how do you truly scientifically prove that that was the thing that moved a needle somewhere on crime or something like that? Um, so we're, we're working on that, is what I can say. I think there's a serious effort now trying to figure out what that stuff looks like. Um, uh, I think when we get on the other side of that, uh, sort of selfishly looking at how can we do it ourselves first, we, we're gonna have some conversations about like, what do we produce that's useful for the field itself that people can replicate and easily use, and then what else can we, um, where do other investments need to happen? That's gonna be about a 10 month process for us to even get through the first phase of that, so it is coming soon, I would say. The thing that I might add is I think it's important for us to remember that not all research is created equal, and that there are at least three kinds of research that I've seen regularly sort of muddled up together. Um, and I like to think of them as the, you know, how did we do? The wait, what just happened? And the why won't you love me, right? So the sort of how did we do is project-based evaluation, right? My project is trying to do something. I wanna know if I did it and how well I did it, right? That's one kind of thing that's very much between the funder that's funding the project and the, and the entity that is doing the project, right? That's that kind of thing. The wait what just happened is where I think a lot of our research lives, which is looking at the externalities of the project. Someone is trying to do something. I'm creating a storytelling festival. I am doing that in order to share stories and create a community of storytellers. It happened to have a giant economic impact, right? So there was this externality that happened. And we need to do that. That's in some ways the purest research because that's going out there and sort of investigating what happened. And then the why won't you love me is the kind of work I think we need for our 515 um, colleague, which is there's something I want to do. I know it is the right thing to do, and I want to make someone fall in love with it and give me resources to do it. And that is a very specific kind of storytelling that I think in the art space we get a little mixed up because artists, when they're telling an art story, care about the story. Right, they want to polish it, they want to make it a jewel, and they want to make it perfect, and then share it with the world. Mm -hmm. The kind of storytelling we're talking about that's case making, that's advocacy, that's lobbying, actually has to start with the audience. Who am I talking to? What is it they care about? And how can I connect with that to get them to do the thing I want them to do? 
So I think we also need to be clear about what kinds of research we're talking about, because different kinds of resources will then get unlocked in different ways to roll that out, et cetera, et cetera. So I might just add that. Great, and we have one more question with Amy, and then we'll give a little time to, do you guys have any clo closing comments? And then Chuck's gonna wrap. So Amy, why don't you go quick and... Okay, hi, my name is Amy Demmer, and I live in Grand Marais, Minnesota, which is on the Canadian border. Um, and we live in a really remote town, and we are very, very fortunate that our community has invested in the arts for nearly 100 years. So we are an arts destination, and we have um, the highest per capita number of artists um, in the state of Minnesota live in my Cook County, which is 3,300 square miles and there's 5,000 people there. And they're busiest in February. <laughs> we are now, so. we are a seasonal tourist economy and we are now busier in February than in August because of our creative um, <coughs> educational opportunities that people um, love to come and visit. So we are really fortunate. We are landlocked by the sea of Lake Superior, the boundary waters, the Canadian border, uh, one road in. So. Um, Five percent of our land is developable and the rest is public. So what's happened with our investment and our quality of life and our artists and our artists, entrepreneur businesses is gentrification. Gentrification. So we're talking rural and when we're talking gentrification in my community. And so the question is, what do we do when we make these investments in a community and how do we think a hundred years down the road? We heard um, Nick for Zach, sorry, Mannheim, we're talking about in 30 years, we want people, they're gonna be moving out of the epicenters of urban areas, we want them to move into rural. But how do we maintain a place where our artists can afford to live as well? You know, if we have the highest number of artists per capita in the state, but the lowest average wage is at $18,000 a year, and we have the same cost of living as the Twin Cities, average home prices are $300,000 to buy a home. If you want running water, you have to pay $200,000. So this is a major thing that my community is tackling with. We are so lucky, our EDA, we've been working on a year-long planning process to create the next generation of arts economy and to attract and retain artists into our community as our um, number one business diversification strategy and investment. Um, and I'm so grateful for that buy-in, but I still continue to think about and struggle with as we look to all of these communities and rural areas that are investing in arts and the quality of life and our people, which we know is good and it comes from who we are and where we live and who we want to be, um, but how do we protect that for the future? <laughs> Gentrification, equitable development, lightning round, go. <laughs> <laughs>
um, it's you know not necessarily something that smacks you in the face every day. But you know, there's places like um, Maynesville, Ohio, that has uh, 20 galleries and 300 artists, uh, working artists. Um, we have the Jonesboro experience. We have the Black Mountains in, in uh, Western North Carolina with the Made in America group and, and of course um, incredible work in Pennsylvania also in New York. And the challenge that, that we have in, in moving forward is keeping this conversation and bringing this conversation up from uh, underneath um, just the holler, but, but into forums like this. Um, you know, the commitment and the work of the state act, uh, the state uh, USDA direct, development directors are really are important partners. And the engagement of, of the land grant schools who do the research are important partners. And there are a lot of elements out there to build on. And you know, um, I mean, what I would what I would say, what I would, would would hope is that we continue the conversation. We build on the assets that we have. That we build this movement the same way you build your local movements. It's all about taking the next steps, having a plan, and working that plan. So it's great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to go next because I have to duck out. Um, I do want to take the opportunity to thank, first of all, all of you who have made the time and the space um, in your worlds, in, in your job that <laughs> when you're not earning money. Um, I also want to thank Chuck and Teresa and all the folks at Rupery um, again because Chuck has been a visionary in this, and he has also been generative and iterative in this work, seeing the future of it, um, staying committed to it, uh, and, and that, I think, is oftentimes unique in our environment. Um, NACO is really pleased, I think, to be able to do some of this work and, and with, with the Americans for the Arts and, and with others. Um, it, for me, it is such a, a gift to be able to go over the course of a career and still find myself involved in the arts. Um, and so I just applaud the work that people are doing. Um, I wish people got speed on their <coughs> travels home. <coughs> and I have to tell you, this is the stuff that gives me so much hope for what can be, in spite of what this next month will be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, three quick things. Thank you again to Arch World, Rupery, University of Iowa, DRA, ARC, um, and USDA. Uh, so, you've heard this like seven times, I can do it in a minute, you should face me five times. Uh, it's about, um, in, in this work in the last seven years, I've got to travel to 40 states doing rural economic, community economic development. The best trips are those that I get to go out for a couple days and be in a couple regions, across the river to the other state, or just across you know, the hill to the other region. Uh, and the, the difference in rural places can be, can be kind of startling. That place that's um, stuck uh, isn't moving forward, it's looking backward, versus that place that is moving forward, where there's energy, where there's hope, where there's a plan and people collaborating, working toward the plan. And there's things happening. And on paper, before I got there, you look at those two regions, and I looked at those two regions and their economic history, their assets, their educational, their demographic, they're pretty much the same place until you were there, and they were two totally different places. And the question, obviously, what's the difference? And really, the difference, it is people. And it's not, and it is people in general. It is really, in these rural places, it's usually one or two or three people who make that choice to be a social entrepreneur, to take risks, to bring 
all of the tools that they have, can, can muster, all their time and talents, and collaboration and sharing and generosity to move the community forward. Uh, and there's a lot of those people in this big room right now. So, so thank you, keep doing what you're doing. And then, I'm sorry, the last thing I want to say, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, no, 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 I'm sorry. Um, is that, um, I, I mentioned in my little personal story when, when I opened that, it's happening, right? I mean, this, this conversation about the future of rural places and the cultural asset as an integral and essential part, it's, it's not like a dream, it's happening. It's happened today. You think, even, even five years ago, uh, having this as part of a, a big part of the conversation on rural community economic development, frankly, it was not, nothing I would have thought of or dreamed of. It just, it, it wasn't there. Um, and the degree of participation from the federal government rural development and from NEA and from others, you know, it's real, it's there. In the Obama administration and in the White House Rural Council, we have positioned the work, the place-based work, so that it can continue. It's up to you whether it does. And not only is it happening, but it matters. It matters so deeply, not only to those rural communities. But to that national conversation, and I'm, I'm not going to go there, Chuck, hey, now you better. Um, that, <laughs> you can go on. <laughs> but that, that hard conversation that we're all observing and part of that's happening right now, it's important every place in this country. I will argue it's more important in rural places in what what you're doing is a critical piece of it. It, it is happening in your, it can only happen in your communities. So thank you so much for being part of that and leading it, and thanks. Now, <laughs> Reverend Fluarty steps to the pulpit. I think it is so wonderful that we have a man like that in the Domestic Policy Council of our country. And we have men and women like these working every day to make this happen. It is so important. Two last things. Thank you for those of you that have started to work together. Look at those white sheets. Their cards, their ideas. Unfortunately, there are more white sheets over here than are in Phil. Um, David has requested uh, that we all do something I think is very cool. David, you and your community, we want to thank you so much for your great work all week. We're going to live with this event for another year because of the great work of Howard. Let's give them a great one. How would we know if we're successful? In 10 years, some of you can say, I participated in the Next Generation Summit the first time in Iowa City. If we build a movement, you will have a place that will never go away as a founder. There is no way Matt and I and our teams, the University of Iowa, USDA, DRA, <laughs> Uh, ARC and our many funders can thank you enough. For those of you that we weren't able to support, but you came on your own, thank you. There's so many of you. Our commitment is to work very hard however we can with the limited resources we have, with the little boat we have in this really big ocean to keep it. <coughs> it's just been a tremendous, tremendous honor to serve you. I help us understand how we can do that better. We don't know right now. We want to be there. David has a great idea in closing. Since this will be the landmark moment in the movement you're building, 
David would like to chronicle it. The bus is waiting for this. Could we all go fairly immediately to the first floor and David will take a picture of this community together down on the first floor where you came in. So we'll live forever. Then we can come back and have face-to-face -face round table discussions. Did I miss anything? The bus will wait. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Safe travels home.